Hi everyone, thank you. Um, like the introduction said, my name is Francois Nika. Um, I've been project manager on the Actress team for the last five years, and I've been honored to be part of the Actress team for the last 10 years already on the Actress team. So, let's look at what I'll be talking about today. I'll be telling you who we are and where we are, I'll tell you about our mobile requirements, I'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about the .NET standard and where that fits in with our project. Uh, look at mobile frameworks that's available and what we consider, pros and cons of some of them and um, well, how we made our decision. We'll take a bit of a deep dive into Xamarin and Xamarin Forms and lastly I'll give you a demo of where we are with our mobile application. Cool, let's start. Who is Actress? Actress is a software as a service provider to the general insurance industry and they're based in the United Kingdom and Europe. So people basically lease their software. Um, they've got customers in over 40 countries around the world. Actress is one of the UK's highest rated and fastest growing technology companies dedicated to delivering awesome solutions to their clients. And Vivian D has been a proud partner, development partner with Actress for the last 17 years. In 2015, Actress was named the number one tech company privately held by UK's Megabyte Technology Group. So, where are we? Like I mentioned, head office is based in London. They've got 430 employees there currently with plus minus 200 business analysts um, that we work with. They've also got a remote development site in Poland that consists of C++ developers, c -sharp developers, and quite a big QA team. And one of our own BBND employees is also stationed there. The guys with no flurries. Um, and then our BBD team. We're a team of 45 guys based in Johannesburg at the housing office. We consist of C++ developers, c -sharp developers, BB developers, business analysts, and testers. Cool. So I did a talk about Actress two years ago at Escape as well. And I focused a lot on the Actress broker platform and our journey into the Silver Life application. Um, and I focused a lot on web services, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I do want to give you a quick overview of what our framework looks like so that you know where we are as we go on. We've got an Oracle database, and it's hosted as a private cloud solution for various legal reasons. Um, the Brits don't want Donald Trump to make rules over who owns their data. Um, so I host it in private cloud. Our backend components are written in C++. They're hosted in Complus, um, also in a data center. Then, uh, yeah, so all our business logic sits in the backend components. Um, Actress, like I said, it's an insurance platform, so it deals with client contact relationship management, um, issuing of quotes, uh, requesting of quotes, managing your policies, managing your claims, complaints, and it does your accounting as well. So all the business logic sits in the backend. Then we've got web services. Web services is a layer written on top of our backend that's got two endpoints, a binary endpoint and an XML endpoint. The XML endpoint allows third parties to integrate with the actual service. Uh, the nicest example I've seen with a third party integration is Caterpillar earth moving equipment. You know the big yellow things? So in the UK, this is a true story, they've got a website where you can order these earth moving equipment um, online. So you click add to basket, I'm not making this up. You add to basket a bulldozer, and there's a tick box that says I want to take out insurance on my bulldozer. And that's all facilitated through the web services. And then we've got the binary endpoint where we talk to the front end suite that we develop for Actress. Our main application is the ABP, the Actress Broke platform, that contains all the functionality. This is written in Silverlight, and it serves desktop applications. We've also got a scanning module that's written in WPF that allows our clients to um, take a stack of documents, pop them in a scanner, and we use optical character recognition to attach them to the correct clients, policies and quotes and contact documents. We've also got a scaled down version of the ABP, which is just, it's called the document management system. It's a read-only version of the system that only allows um, agents to attach and manage documents related to, to a client, attached documents. And then lastly is the mobile, the one I'll be talking about today. 
um, which, we'll, which I'll tell you more about as we go along. Important to note that big block there that says PCL framework. I'll tell you more about that and all the shared code we've got currently. So, before we continue, I have to tell you about the .NET standard, what it is and where it fits in. So, in 2014, Microsoft announced that they'll be providing the full .NET server stack as open source, including ASP.NET, the compiler, the runtime, and all framework and libraries. This is pretty awesome because this allows <coughs> .NET developers to, lot, to develop for Mac and Linux. But, as you can imagine, it's not as easy as going to your Mac or your Linux machine, say git pull and type make and all your Linux or all your .NET code now suddenly runs on a, on a Mac or Linux. Developers still needed to go and implement the platform specific APIs um, for Mac and for Linux. And this led to the following problem. In the .NET world, um, you develop for a specific target platform. WPF, Windows Universal, Universal Application, ASP.NET Core, or Xamarin on this box. But you talk to base libraries. Now, the nicest example I can think of is keyboard enumeration. On a Mac, you've got that little command key. I had to ask someone what that key was because I'm not a Mac user. On the Windows, you've got a Windows key, and I don't know if Linux has a special key. I think not. But that's specific to that platform. And that's something that a developer had to go and implement on that platform. So this leads to fragmentation. If I developed .NET code, C Sharp or BB.NET, targeted for WPF, that code won't run in .NET Core, Windows Universal App, or Xamarin, because it's targeted to a specific base library. So as a first iteration to solve this, Microsoft introduced portable class libraries. Portable class libraries is the minimum set of functionality that's supported in all base libraries. So for example, it won't include the Windows key or the Mac key, it will just include the, the, include the keys in your keyboard enumeration that's common between both libraries. Um, this solved some of it, but you don't have all your API functionality available when you develop. And this is where .NET Standard comes in. <coughs> .NET Standard is a set of APIs that all platforms will have to implement. And it unifies the .NET platform. It prevents future fragmentation, and this will replace PCL completely. Um, it will be implemented in .NET Core, Xamarin, and the full .NET framework. So, are we there yet? Not quite. So, as you might or might not know, Silverlight is unfortunately not on the roadmap for Microsoft to be supported in .NET, uh, in .NET Standard 2. But, we still use portable class libraries. And it will be possible for us in future to compile our PCR libraries as .NET standard libraries. So what do we have that is shared? We've got a big portable class library, and we share all our HTTP communications used to talk to the web services to make use of the AppShare's functionality. Um, we encapsulate our whole security model in our portable class library. All caching is done for you. All messages that you need to talk to the server to set up your session is handled through the PCR library. Um, and message validation happens here. Yeah. So what that means is, in that first slide where, slide where we looked at the framework, every front-end solution that we deploy share the same code. That means that when you start, you know that the security is in place, it's tried and tested, um, it's a performant piece of code that you're working with uh, that's already used in other places. And it allows you to really focus on just the functionality you want to deliver with that new front-end solution. Um, some other helpful things we've got in here is compression that's shared over the whole solution. Uh, screen rule evaluation. We'll get to screen rules a little bit later when we look at the web services. And a basic navigation tree is also included in our, our portable class library. Then something we introduced for mobile specifically is an offline provider. So we use a SQLite database that can cache calls. So on a mobile device, you might lose connectivity. Um, and calls that you would make to the server, for example, are not lost. Let's say I've, I've spent 10 minutes to update the contact's main details, and I click save, but my network, I just drove underneath the bridge. 
um, those calls are saved in a SQLite database. And as soon as your connectivity is restored, those messages are repaid against the server, so you don't lose any work. This is also in PCL, which means then that all our other front-end solutions automatically get this functionality for free. We compile this PCL library and we store it in a package manager called Artifactory. Um, that means that everyone, anyone that wants to start a new uh, development of a new front-end on the Axure system can just do a checkout of the portable class library and they can start developing. Third-party tools that Axure themselves have developed is the process execution engine. They hosted the Windows workflow um, designer to make web service call. And the integration team used this. So they will go to a new client that they want to onboard, dump all the data in an export file format, for example, and they would write a Windows workflow that runs through our web services and input all the data, all using the PCR library. As we go on, there's more and more code that we identify that we want to put in the PCR library. So as soon as we identify a piece of code and says this is important and this is shared across all our platforms and it's something we want to reuse, we move it into the PCR library. We've got some performance counters in there as well and the latest stats from the PCR library specifically, so this is all the front ends now, is that there are over 12,000 concurrent users of this library every day. And another very interesting fact is one in 8,000 user actions results in an error being displayed to the user. So it's not a system crash, it's just the user doing something that he shouldn't, which I think is quite awesome. So, mobile requirements. Um, it's very important to look at your requirements when you look at a framework. Not all frameworks fit all requirements. And I want to give you some of our requirements that we had um, when we chose a, a mobile framework. And it's important to keep those in mind to see if they fit your project as well. Um, Multi-platform. We wanted to target the most popular platforms. So it's obviously iOS and Android. And with the reappearance of the Nokia 3310, we might need to consider Symbian as well, or whatever Nokia is running. So we'll see. Um, shared code. It would have been a great plus for us if we could use our portable class library that we've got already and make use of that shared code. Performance. So our Silverlight front-end solution currently is pretty fast. It's got a great user experience and we wanted to carry that through to our mobile solution. And lastly, security. Security is absolutely important for actress. But I've recently only found out that anyone making use of any service of Actras need to do so from a static IP. Okay, so that's pretty hectic if you think about it. So any service that you use on the Actras network, you have to do that from a static IP. Um, as you can imagine, this won't work for mobile devices. You can't go around to all your clients and say, okay, please change your IP to a fixed IP. But they needed a security model that would give them the same functionality and flexibility and security. So the protocol we settled on was TLS 1.2. In this scenario, a mobile user will um, hit a registry endpoint on the server, and the server will generate a client certificate. The certificate is then stored on the server and issued to the mobile device that installs the certificate. When the mobile device then communicates with the server, the channel is secured by using a client and a server certificate. This gives actors the ability to revoke the server uh, uh, the certificate on the server side should the device fall into the wrong hands or they no longer have access to the uh, functionality of the actress network. <coughs> Let's look at some of the options that we considered when we did our research into mobile development. Firstly, there's Cordova, and I'm going to put HTML on with that. Um, Cordova is Java based and runs on Node.js. And it targets multiple platforms with a single code stream, which is a big plus. It uses HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to achieve this. I don't remember if you remember the first slide, but those are not skills we currently have in our team. So if we decided to go this route, it's, we had to invest in, in new skills on our team, and we had to skill up. Um, there's also the problem with a lot of mobile browsers that you get out there and a lot of different hardware configurations, different screen sizes uh, that, that comes with serving HTML. 
Our current front-end solutions are also, I don't want to call them fat clients, but there's a lot of client-side processing in rendering uh, the messages that happen. So it wouldn't completely fit in with our current framework that we have. Native iOS and Android development would certainly solve some of these problems. But you would need two code streams, you would need two teams. And again, it's something that we would have had to skill up on, as we had no native iOS or Android developers on the team. Uh, but it would give you a performant uh, application. So the last one we looked at was Xamarin. Xamarin allowed us to code in C-sharp, developers that we already had, and target multiple platforms with a single code stream. So let's dive a little bit deeper into Xamarin. What is Xamarin? Xamarin delivered native Android and iOS using our existing skills and teams and code. So it compiles to native Android and native iOS code. Anything you can do in Objective-C, Swift or Java, you can do in c -sharp. I know the Java guys don't like hearing that. It gives you access to native user interfaces. So once you've coded your Xamarin application, the controls you see in your application are native controls to that platform. And native API access. Native API access gives us access to the fingerprint reader, the camera, and all the hardware goodies that's supported on that specific device. And everything native, 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 you get native performance. Once you compile this application, it runs just as fast as if you had written it in Objective-C or Swift. Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android is best suited for apps with interaction that require native behavior. Um, app that, apps that use many platform specific APIs and apps where custom UI is more important than code sharing. That's the one aspect of Xamarin. On top of this, you get Xamarin Forms. Xamarin Forms is a layer on top of Xamarin that allows you to code your UIs in cross-platform code as well. <coughs> it still gives you access to native user interfaces. You get na access to native APIs when you need it. You can inject the functionality. Um, and it comes out of the box with a bunch of controls and layouts that you can use. Um, Xamarin Forms is best suited for applications where you've got a lot of code sharing and you don't access a lot of the native functionality on that device. What we love about Xamarin, why was Xamarin a good fit for Actress? Firstly, we could code in C-sharp, so it's a skill set we already have on our team. We can code in a familiar environment to us. We could use Visual Studio 2017 to do our mobile development. We could reuse some of the skills that we learned. So in Silverlight, we learned about the MVVM pattern and binding messages that we get from our server to UI elements and that's stuff that we could reuse straight in Xamarin. We get a lot of code share. 80% of the code we have in our Xamarin, Xamarin application currently is shared and only 20% of the code is platform specific. So platform specific code is when you log in using your fingerprint or when you want to render a control that's not quite native to iOS, we inject that behavior into the iOS platform and that's platform specific code. Okay, so how do we go about our daily development and delivery? We, we currently use Hockey App. So Hockey App, we're not live yet. I have to tell you guys that, we're not live yet, we're in the process. Um, so we develop in Visual Studio, we compile, and then how do we get the app onto devices? Because you can't publish to the Play Store every time you've got a dev book. We use Hockey App, Hockey App is an application that our testers and analysts install on their phone. And when we do a build, we take the binary APK for in Google for it, in Android for example, and we push it to Hockey App. The app on the testers' devices will then notify them that there's a new dev build available and they can click install. So it's like a, a Play Store for, for developers. Um, and they get the latest version. This will be replaced by Mobile Center. Microsoft bought over Hockey App and they're in the process of um, completely <coughs> rewriting that uh, application. And Mobile Center will give you the additional functionality after going to the Play Store and the iOS Store as well. And lastly, Xamarin Test Cloud. Xamarin Test Cloud is an awesome platform online where you publish your application to and it runs UI tests on your application. 
as you know, there are hundreds of mobile devices and configuration and screen sizes um, available out there. And how do you know that your app is going to run on all of them and run correctly on all of them? So what you do is you write front-end unit tests that check that your button is in view, your login button is displayed where you think it's displayed, and you publish it to Xamarin Test Lab. Xamarin Test Lab have physical devices. It's not emulators, it's not virtualized, it's physical devices that they automatically deploy your app to and run these UI test, tests. And then it notifies you that, yes, all your tests ran successfully, or you might have a problem on Lollipop on the Nexus, for example. Uh, you have to have a look there. Cool. Let's, I want to quickly show you what our web services look like before we continue. Just so that you get an idea of what we're working with when we're developing the mobile platform. We have what you call a self-describing web service. So usually with the API, you're gonna, you need a thick stack of documents to tell your customers how to integrate with your web service. We opted for a self-describing web service where we only tell the client what calls are available, not how they work. If you want to do a locate contact, for example, you just send this message to the server, and I promise you, this is all it is, just in a locate contact. And the response you'll get from the server looks something like this. So this is the server telling you what you need to send it to do a locate contact. So this replaces the documentation for your API. Um, it's got a bunch of details in there. I'm just going to focus on the first one. Locate contact search on is an element that you have to tell the server. Um, its description is just search on. So you will need to tell the server what you're looking for. Its availability is mandatory. Its type is a single select. In our world, a single select is a lookup list. So there's a list associated with this field that contains all the valid selections for this element. It's got a length and a default value. As you can see in the next element, we can also dynamically restrict uh, the availability or description or type based on other selections. So we can change the type dynamically, we can change the availability uh, dynamically uh, based on your selection. So for example, if I'm searching for a name and surname, my search on field will be text. If I'm searching for a date of join or a specific date, the type of the field actually changes to a date field. And all this metadata allows us to bind to our front ends and generate screens because we've got a lot of data here that allows us to generate the screens. This is all config driven and actuaries can change any of these properties you see directly in the database. And this will then affect all third parties and all front ends and they will work in a similar fashion. Cool, so one of the biggest problems we faced in going to a mobile platform is the amount of screen space you've got available. So that's our Silverlight application you see there on the left, and you've got lots of space. You can render all those fields that the locate contact call came back with um, on the screen. You can render drop downs and text boxes and a menu bar and everything. But on a mobile device, you don't have all that screen real estate. But your customers still want the same functionality. So I'm going to walk you through this locate screen and just showed you what we did design-wise to still give the user the same functionality but with a lot less space. <coughs> Firstly, the home bar at the top that you can use to browse to different uh, spots in the application with, we've got at the bottom where you can browse to home, your tasks, or perform a search. The menu on the left, that navigation tree you see there, we replaced with a single icon. Okay. So we are currently on the locate contact screen and that little man that you see there, that icon represents a locate contact. If you click on that man, it expands and gives you all the locate options that you have available. The single mandatory field, what you want to search on, we place top center because that's the most important field that you need to complete. And the other fields are filters. So do you only want active contents, or contacts? Do you want a specific contact subtype like agents or introducers, or are you only looking for someone that belongs to a specific account exec? And all those filters we replace with a single filter icon that opens up a pop-up um, to filter your search results. And then the main search results are still replay, uh, displayed in a grid format or a tile format in the center of the screen. 
Just a quick look at what that looks like. Um, on, the, on the left, if you click on the little man icon, you get locate contact, locate RFQ, locate policy. Um, if you click on locate contact, for example, you've got your options. Sorry, I see it's very small. Um, but the idea is you, get, you can choose now locate contact, locate bank account details, um, locate <coughs> on first name, surname, and then the, the search filters. Contact type, these are drop downs that we render, and now I can still do my filtering. And the results are displayed similarly to the Silverlight UI, just in a grid format, where the user can then click and select the contact that they want. The next big design challenge is the menu. Again, with a lot of screen real estate, you can display a context tree, you know where you're navigating to, you know which contact you're working with, and that's a luxury you don't have on mobile, so it's something we have to work around. So you pick up your phone and you see there's main details, or there's a policy open, but you don't know what contact you're working with, or you're jumping between tasks that assigned, that's assigned to you, but you don't know whose contact are you currently working with. So to get around that, we introduced the context bar. The context bar is that blue bar you see at the bottom. The context bar gives you the owner of the screen that I'm currently working on. So if I'm looking at an RFQ, that's a request for quote, or a quote, or a policy main details, the person that that item belongs to will be displayed at the bottom. We also added some extra functionality to that bar, so if I click the bar, I can jump to the contact. Um, that's functionality you had for free when, you're, when you've got the navigation tree on the left. I can click anywhere on the navigation tree and jump. Uh, but with a mobile device, it's a bit more linear. And that bar allows us to jump around. Cool, so let's look at a demo of our application. To click twice to start this. This is the result of having one code base compiling to Android and iOS. You can see the applications look similar and you get native controls on, on each platform. On the left we've got Android, on the right we've got iOS. Please don't read anything into the speed of these videos. Android is not slower than iOS. Um, the conditions under which these videos were recorded were vastly different. So, Donald, you're not allowed to say iOS is faster. And we land on the home screen. On the home screen you've got access to your favorites, your tasks, tasks that are assigned to you, um, by other users, and so on. This is our home screen, and we're just gonna browse around. Uh, recent searches allows you to look at searches that you've already performed. On a mobile device, you wanna save some data, so we cache in that SQLite database searches that you've already performed, and you can go back to your recent searches. Um, you've got access to task management, and you've also got access to pinned items and favorites uh, that you can browse to. So yeah, this is just the user browsing around in our mobile application. And that's what our contact main details look like. Next one is a video where we browse um, to a task and we just edit some details of this task. This just shows how we use that web service and we bind to elements in the mobile platform. Um, so the single select that I talked about is that pop-up that you see there and the valid options that you're allowed to select are presented in a pop-up. And again, this is all config driven by the server side. Should actors add or remove items that's available for selection, we don't have to recompile the mobile device or any of the other front ends, as it's all driven by the web services. And this makes it very powerful to change things. In this video, we browse to an RFQ. And what I want to show you here at the bottom is the, the context bar. Um, fleet rated commercial motor RFQ for BBD Charmaine. That's our test user. So you know exactly which person you're working with when viewing contact main details or RFQ main details. Um, certain items in, in the actual application also have context. So tasks can be created for you to follow up with a specific contact, contact or update policy details, or you have to do something specific uh, on the actual system. So this is where we pulled in the context bar again. So if someone assigns me a task that says, please follow up with contact A, the context bar at the bottom changes to contact A's context. So I open a task that guys might have assigned to me, and I just click on the context bar, and it jumps me straight to that contact. 
so I don't have to go back to search for that contact. And this allows me to jump to multiple levels in the navigation tree, which you've got for free with a full desktop app and a navigation tree available on the left. <coughs> and the last video that you see here is an example of a fully generated screen. So the screen you see here, no developer went and designed and laid out controls. We just take the web service as is, only use the metadata available, and render the field straight. So at the end, when we do decide, or when we go live, we aim to have over 400 screens on our application. And it's very important for us to, have gener to make use of generated screens to deliver this on time um, and quickly. So, what are some of our future plans? Where do we go to from here? We still have automated deployment and automated testing to do. We don't do our testing in Xamarin Test like that, yet that's something we still need to develop. And automated deployment with build servers to fit in with our other solutions that we do as well, that we have to set up. We are investigating an ASP.NET Core web solution. So, because ASP.NET Core is also supported by .NET Standard, we get the benefit of using our shared code on the server side. If we can serve HTML, we've got a quick and easy way to target a lot more devices with a browser interface. But this is something for the future. We did a very interesting proof of concept with Actress using Google Vision API. So with your mobile device, you're able to log a claim, say new claim, you go to attach documents, and you take a photo with your phone. We submit that to Google Vision API, and with image recognition, Google comes back with text <coughs> tags of what it sees in the photo. It's able to identify a car, make, and model, sometimes even the year, the color, so it'll come back that there's a blue VW polo in an accident, and it recognized the license plate number. So this is pretty awesome because those are stuff that you tend to forget and panic when you're in an accident situation. And we can use something like Google Vision API to help log all the correct details for a claim. Cool, so what makes our team very successful? Our long history with Actuary certainly gives us a deep level of understanding of their product and what they want to deliver. But this is not the only reason we we are a successful team. We use a lot of code generators. I always say we've got a very lazy team, but it's not really true. Um, we rely on code generation, and we generate as much as we can. We automate as much as we can. And this allows us to put in less effort for the amount of output that we get. And this is important. It sort of ties in with Aki's the keynote there, where things are changing so fast. You can't go back and reinvent it every time. Who knows if Google and iOS will still be the preferred choices of platform tomorrow. And then you can't really go back and, and reinvent it every time. Silverlight is a good example. It's been discontinued by Microsoft. We're not worried because we've got all the shared code and we can just roll it on to our new front end. We focus on reuse. The PCL library makes this apparent and we try and move more and more code into something that's reusable that we can use for future decks. The next one, front end follows trends. So we know the front end will probably be replaced in a year or two years um, time. And it's not a bad thing. The hardware that the end user used to interact with your application changes rapidly. So who thought a couple of years ago that you're going to have to develop for a device that's got eight cores and a 4K display, a 4K display, but that's the user's mobile device. That's not even his desktop. So that's how fast things are moving. Ideally, your front end should be a drop-in replacement. Right? Take it out, drop in a new one in the latest day. We're not there yet, but with code generation, I think we will get to a point where front ends are just generated and replaced as you need. What methodology do you use on the Actuarist team? So, we don't have a strict agile or waterfall methodology. It depends on what team you ask and it depends on what time of the development phase we're in. The backend guys, especially from the client's perspective, use a much more waterfall approach. We get signed off CRs that's been approved by the client, that we give estimates on and we develop. On the mobile side, currently, 
it's much more agile. Um, to validate the client will send us requirements, we'll do the requirements, and they'll say, no, 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 we want to change our mind. But importantly, in all of this is communication. It doesn't matter what methodology you follow. If you don't have good communication with your client, you're bound to fail. So a big challenge for us, as you saw with that world map, client is not local, client is in the UK and they're in Poland, and we work closely together with those developers and analysts. Um, it's very important for us to communicate. We use technologies like Skype for Business, Link, and the telephone, old school telephone. Just pick up the phone and phone them and ask them. Um, and this enables us to really do fast and high quality delivery. Automate everything. If something can be automated, please automate it. Um, it'll make your life much easier tomorrow when you don't have to spend time to reinvent the wheel. So that's why I say future work, automate the Xamarin deliveries and builds. Um, this allows for quick delivery to the client. Quick response times, again ties in with Aki's keynote where you don't have a lot of time. Technology changes so quickly. You want to be there quickly and you want to release quickly. Team structure is very important. So the graph of, or the figure I've got up there leans to the fact that you need less senior developers and more junior developers. Sometimes the myth is that I need 10 senior developers to get this project live. We found that that's not necessarily always true. A good mature team makes very good use of junior developers and analysts and you need those guys to have a successful delivery. Share the knowledge, build the guys up. On our team, we do code reviews, but we don't use it as a policing mechanism. A uh, team of 45 guys working full-time, and you can imagine the amount of change that goes into every release of our system. And it's difficult as one developer in a team of 45 to keep track of all the change. We use code reviews as a, a platform to share that change that I've introduced. If you work on a CR, get the guys together, Bring your code up on screen and say, this is the change request I'm working on and this is how the, the system is changing. This allows your junior guys to stay up to date, learn, and maybe even take over from you someday. And just some final notes. The importance of non-functional requirement. That's the, the speed of your system. That's the quality of your code. What patterns are you implementing? We find that that is extremely important. Help the guys to implement best practices. Don't code for the requirements you get today, for today. Code for the changes that you know are coming from your client. And make sure your platform is in a good state. On Actress, we're very fortunate to have a very mature client. How it works on our team is developers are able to identify areas of the code that they want to refactor. We communicate this through to our client and we said there's a certain area of code due to changes and requirements that we want to relook at. The client will then log that refactoring up as part of a general change request going into every release. And you get assigned your refactoring that you've identified um, before the release goes in. And the client then goes through the trouble of testing it again. Um, but very important. Uh, like I said, our team's been going for 17 years now and we don't want to introduce something like code smell or code rot, it will get impossible to maintain. 20 years ago, we had a VB6 app with a team that worked long hours, and we worked really hard to get to a point where we feel that we can deliver quickly, high quality products to our clients in eight hour days, not 16 hour days. Technology should not be an inhibitor. No matter what mobile tech you choose, what platform you choose that suits your requirements, there's going to be a learning curve. Make it fun for the developers. Skill up your developers. Don't just go and hire senior developers that's experts in the area. Um, your team carries a lot of inherent knowledge about your product. That's really important to make it a success. Oh.